afternoon roundtable session. I think as fitting, uh, both because kind of coming to the end uh, of the conference gathering here, we're focusing on eschatology, but also for the second Sunday in Easter, a uh, chance to focus on eschatology as well. Um, so we have uh, three fine panelists up here. Let me introduce myself real quick. My name is uh, Daniel P. Rhodes, and I currently teach at Loyola Chicago at the Water Tower campus and Institute of Pastoral Studies just down the street here. Um, and I teach in social justice, and then I also coordinate contextual education for our students as well. Um, as I mentioned, this, uh, this roundtable is going to focus on uh, eschatology. Um, and we have uh, several or three different slants or takes on eschatology and focus on eschatology. Um, the way that this will work is pretty standard roundtable session. Um, all of our panelists will present. They'll have about 15 to 20 minutes to do that. Um, well, I'll try to keep them as close as possible to that time limit as we can. And then we'll give them about 30 minutes to engage with one another, to discuss between their presentations, to ask questions of one another, uh, and to respond. And then we'll open the floor for you to ask questions. Um, and I'll give some instructions before we do that at the end. So for our first panelist uh, to present today, uh, yeah, if you, I guess you probably noticed this, but we've got several Daniels up here. So if, if you're at all lost and you don't know who you're asking a question to, just say Daniel. And we might have to sort it out for a few minutes, but we'll, we'll probably eventually catch it and you'll Daniel, likely be wrong. Daniel. Sorry, Reynaldo. <laughs> so uh, Daniel Pilario is a member of the Congregation of Missions uh, in the Philippines, and he's a dean and a professor wearing many hats. Uh, at St. Vincent School of Theology, Adamson University in uh, Quezon City. He's published a few uh, volumes, uh, books, Back to the Rough Grounds of Praxis, where he explores uh, the method of Pierre Bedeau. Uh, and he has also published The Ambivalence of Sacrifice in 2013 and Christian Orthodoxy in 2014, among other publications and articles that he submitted. He's also uh, on the editorial board of Hippog, uh, and Concilium, uh, and he's the former president and founding member of Daca Teo, the Catholic Theology Society of the Philippines. Um, you can read on his bio there his interests, and I'm sure those will pop up here. And he's going to start us off with a presentation on ecology and apocalyptic discourse. Thank you very much, Daniel, uh, and good morning, everybody. Thanks to Bill. Uh, and the Center for Liberation for World Catholicism in DePaul for inviting us to this conference. I would like to start with a sober note. Um, I would like to remember in this lecture a friend, my first, uh, my college science teacher, who has suffered cancer for the last 10 years of her life. And when she knew that I was coming here, she asked, uh, what my topic would be and I told her it's on ecology and she says I know that uh, I can come with you but that time she was really she was in bed bedridden and when I came to DePaul just in the morning that we arrived or the afternoon that we arrived I received a news in email that she passed away so um, she is a woman who tried because he's a science teacher, tried very much to understand nature and tried to care for it. She was into everything like bonsai or warm culture and everything like that. Uh, it's in, in this spirit that I would like to begin the discussion on the end of the world, the apocalypse. Um, one author says, uh, Apocalypse is the single most powerful master metaphor that the contemporary environmental imagination has at its disposal. The present environmental crisis announcing itself as apocalypse engenders a whole range of responses. On the one hand, its cataclysmic language provokes fear, paranoia, apathy, inaction, making that whole discourse a self-fulfilling prophecy. On the other hand, uh, its emotionally charged rhetoric seizes people's attention and imagination, which can also possibly lead some, some people toward some responsible social engagement. This uh, paper aims to propose some viable frames 
with which to read contemporary environmental apocalypticism in order to guide us toward an engaged Christian spirituality at the moment in our times. Um, for those who like outlines, uh, here is a slide for you. Uh, I would like to first uh, try to provide a provisional map with which to understand responses to environmental crisis at the moment and try to locate the apocalyptic discourse in that map and later on propose some eco-apocalyptic outlines towards some eco-apocalyptic spirituality. There are, for the purposes of this paper, there are three contemporary responses towards the environmental crisis. Number one is the coronacopian position, second is the pastoral, and the third is the apocalyptic. Uh, the coronacopian position uh, is derived from the Latin cornucopie, or the horn of plain, plenty, a horn-shaped basket or container overflowing with fruits of the earth in the Greek mythology. The, the cornucopian believes that the earth contains enough matter and energy for all, and if ever population increases in leaps and bounds according to Mathos, so does technology to provide for its needs. If the Malthusians are called doomsters, the cornucopians are dubbed, dubbed, dubbed as boomsters. Uh, the problem with climate change, according to this position, for instance, is, it's, is, is seen as scaremongering, green scaremongering, which is not, according to them, really proven by hard evidence. I'm referring to what Mark yesterday said of the 3%. They're actually the 3%, but they are only few, but they are also very noisy because they are backed up by capital. Most of these people in these positions are backed up by capitalists. In short, these optimistic futurists believe that the world evolves in progress towards its perfect end. If challenges, either ecological or political, appear in the present horizons, they are but part of the whole evolutionary process. The problem with this position is that it's not only its political affiliation or economic affiliation, but also its instrument, philosophical position, its instrument, instrumentalist view of nature, which is decidedly anthropocentric. And we had already troubles with that, as we have heard from other speakers yesterday. The second position point to the pastorals as response to the ecological crisis. In many instances, this refers to the idealization of the country or rural life, a retreat from the city and its technological progress. While the cornucopians look to the future in assured optimism, the pastorals go back to the past as pristine existence, a lost ideal that needs to be recovered today. The idea of pure wilderness as ideal existence as a state of uncontaminate, uncontaminated by civilization becomes sacramental to this perspective. The problem with pastorals, however, is the view that nature can only be genuine when it is untouched by humanity. The less touched it is by civilization, the better. Its purity is in fact achieved at the cost of the elimination of human civilization and history, which includes you and me then it ironically exonerates us from both responsibility and realistic engagement. That's the problem of pastoral nostalgia. The third response to the ecological crisis is the apocalyptic form. The classical precursor of environmental apocalypticism is Thomas Malthus' essay on the principle of population 798 which posits that population can increase exponentially and our resources could not provide for its subsistence, thus leading the whole humanity to grim competition for human survival. Though Malthus did not predict a dramatic endgame like the apocalypticists, his theory can even lead to inspiration, lead, lend inspiration to contemporary popular dystopian films like Mad Max or Hunger Games. Uh, you better watch it. That's what I mean. Second, 
uh, environmental apocalypticism. There are two main apocalyp apocalyptic trends prevalent in, in the environmental discourses today. The first is the religious apocalyptic discourse, which is mostly present among the Christian right, and which thinks that environment catastrophe is what the Bible has already predicted. You read the Bible and it's happening today. I'm talking about the Christian right, but also I'm talking about uh, millenarian movements in, in other parts of the world, either Christian or Buddhist or Hindu, etc. Um, in the context of the United States, maybe you can remember in 2011, Harold Camping, the end of the world is May 21, um, and, and other, other movements. Some more fundamentalist quarters think that the rapture, that's Harold Camping, or the Armageddon is God's vengeance and punishment for the world's moral decline. This is a discourse which many environmental apocalypticists of the religious bent uh, carry. The impending ecological cataclysm also spells our eschatological end. This is sadly inevitable but necessary for God to ultimately establish his kingdom. And for this group, all we have to do is wait. Some among the Christian right, however, think that there is actually no certainty, certainty to this positive end. Thus also challenging, challenges their followers res, towards responsible stewardship of creation. The religious apocalyptic discourse is therefore double-edged. On the one hand, it's passive. On the other hand, it's transformative depending on one's theological interpretation and economic political affiliation. The second trend is the secular discourse, which mainly tends to be dystopic and pessimistic in character. Environmental degradation has been described in apocalyptic terms by secular eco-activists. I would like to mention some popular forms. I think you still remember the film uh, 2012. From that film to Al Gore science-based and inconvenient truth. This is purely secular discourse and apocalyptic. Unlike the religious rhetoric, it's not God who is punishing us, but ourselves with our uncontrolled carbon emission, etc., etc. Beyond movies and literatures, we find this discourse in movements like Greenpeace, Earth First, etc. Even as writers and activists acknowledge that what is predicted does not actually exist, this imagined tragedy, according to authors, may actually happen and is happening now. And since God is not there to save the world, there is no promised ultimate anticipation. The world as we know, know it will never be restored to an original splendor. What happens is in fact a dystopic wasteland. While religious apocalyptic discourse aimed at providing its readers the hope for a new heaven and a new earth, the secular discourse is mainly dystopic and pessimistic. And to illustrate this, this I want you to refer to the Hunger Games. Religious and secular apocalyptic rhetoric uh, possesses some common... Uh, ah, okay, this one first. Uh, just, just to point out... Uh, the relationship between religious apocalypticism and radical activism. Uh, there is a tendency to uh, go from one end to the other, from prosperity gospel to the end times theology. According to one guy who has written on American Apocalypse, he says, the point here is that God has given them talents. He's gone away, he's coming back, he's coming back soon, and he's going to ask what you've done with your talents. That moves people towards radical activism, even in the context of religious apocalypticism. There is a relationship between secular apocalypticism and dystopia. And an example of this is uh, an introduction of the population bomb. Uh, this is uh, 1960s. And how and we can see how how dystopic is the language. The battle to feed all humanity is over. In the 1970s, this is the 1960s, hundreds of millions of people were starved to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. 
at this late day, at this late date, nothing can prevent a substantial increase in the world's death rate. So you see um, uh, the apocalyptic language present. Of course, it didn't happen. There are common features uh, in apocalyptic discourse. Number one, the predictions are projected with absolute authority. Number two, the material threat under advocates are evil. Number three, failure to listen would be catastrophic. And number four, the disaster is not only imminent, but is well underway. Uh, and the consequent directions are ambivalent. On the one hand, environmental apocalyptic literature positively contributes in galvanizing otherwise disparate eco-critical positions into some united programs of action through its use of imagination and metaphors. Therefore, no matter how different you are, people are galvanized towards some sort of action because of the use of imagination and metaphor. On the other hand, the emotionalism that usually goes with apocalyptic language tends to polarize positions, simplify complex arguments, and blur the concrete issues, making it an easy material for journalistic sentimentalism and consequently passive skepticism. Thus, in the end, the dystopic apocalyptic genre either leads to the embarrassment of failed predictions or self-fulfilling prophecies. Now, my question is actually very simple. Um, how do we rescue environmental apocalypticism from producing both despair and inaction? Can we present apocalyptic rhetoric as constructive of Christian hope and responsible political engagement? With the limitations of space and time, let me present three points. Post-apocalyptic hope, uh, apocalypse as interruption, and apocalypse as solidarity and compassion. I would like uh, to use some dis disparate sources from James Berger discussion on the post-apocalyptic, John Baptist Metz's idea of uh, the apocalyptic spirituality, and thirdly, I would like them to interact with stories that I have heard, I have experienced, and I have read from the high ends ground zero in summer and late in the Philippines, which just happened a year ago. This typhoon has been described by many as the apocalyptic super typhoon. Therefore, I would like to privilege their experience in the understanding what apocalyptic spirituality would be. Number one. In his book, After the End, James Berger presents the idea of the post-apocalypse. He observes that almost every apocalyptic text is in fact a paradox. The end is never the end. The apocalyptic text announces and describes the end of the world, but then the text does not end. Not the world represented in the text, and neither does the world itself. In nearly every apocalyptic representation, something remains after the end. Something is left over. And the world after the end of the world, the post-apocalypse, is usually the true object of the apocalyptic writer's concern. For instance, the Jerusalem temple has fallen and the world continues. Hiroshima, Holocaust, Vietnam War, etc. These events were decisive breaks from the past. And in fact, they were fulcrum separating which comes before and which comes next. Yet, these apocalyptic ends are not ends of the world. The world impossibly continues, and the apocalyptic writer continues to write. Therefore, the post-apocalypse. Such interpretation of the apocalypse serves two purposes. First, it engenders a sense of hope among the victims. If God's concern is not about the end, but its aftermath, Hope, no matter how modest, glimmers the horizon. I have observed this at the ground zero of the Typhoon Haim. In the morning after the storm, even as the dead were not yet buried, people raised the nation's tattered flag in act of defiance against defeat. A barber who 
whose shop has been raised to the ground by the waves, got an old chair and started to do haircut for his neighbors. He said that even without houses, it's always good feeling to look handsome. When some fishing boats were all gone, the fishermen floated old refrigerators to navigate the waters again and search for fish. A group of women started to plant vegetables in an empty lab, and weeks later, the green backyard became the source of food for the whole community. In front of a tree, what is, what is, what is left of a little hut is a board which announces to those who are doing relief operation. We need house and lot, car and swimming pool. A little joke is a sign of hope and one's sheer willingness to survive. Not everything is perfect yet. Days after the event, bodies were still not buried. Weeks after, after people ran after relief goods. And their silent stares ask God why things happen this way. But their defiant hope can be heard in what a mother's reply to a question from a journalist. He is, she is asked, how can you still survive? She was sitting next to her dead child, not yet buried. And do you think that God is with us today? And she said, if God is not here, who, will, who else is here? Today, many still do not have houses a year after the event. But people are back, back to their feet again. Life continues after the end. Unlike present bleak apocalyptic predictions in films and novels, the victim survivors enact a different narrative. The hope of these people on the ground is a stinging critique to the dystopia and pessimism ecological doomsters preach, both in the religious and secular varieties. Second, the apocalyptic also serves as a comprehensive critique of any existing order. Exegetes tell us that this is the purpose of John's book of Revelation, a critique and nonviolent resistance to the dominant Roman civilization, which the author, John, assesses as oppressive, demonic, and beastly. Apocalyptic discourse tells people that only a total overhaul of the present system can bring about survival and wholeness. This brings me to my next point. Johann Baptist Metz's theology is a reaction to Nietzsche's central concept of eternal recurrence. According to Nietzsche, events will occur again and again infinitely. The world is nothing but a timeless repetition of one and the same. For Metz, this view of endless recurrence and omnipresent time has tragic repercussions to human suffering because with it, uh, radical change is never possible. An example of eternal recurrence is found in the evolutionary thinking where the category of fulfillment uh, category is regarded as an evolutionary process and the kingdom of God is seen as the pure utopia that is achieved by means of human progress. That's a critique towards evolutionary thinking which is present in all capitalistic discourse at the moment. For minutes, such a closed scheme does not offer any way out for the victims of history. If everything is one and the same, how can the victims get out of this whole process? Uh, a good, a good uh, what is this quotation that came from Mitz is this. Catastrophes are reported on the radio in between pieces of music. The music continues to play like the, audi the audible passage of time that moves forward inexorably and can be held back by nothing. It just continues on and on. And as Brecht, Bertolt Brecht has said, when crime is committed, just as the rain falls, no one cries hot. The, victim the victimization continues. Apocalypse, therefore, is an interruption. It, in that idea, it becomes salvific and necessary. Only through apocalyptic vision can the Messiah enter and interrupt history. Unlike the assured optimism, optimism of utopian evolutionary thinking, apocalyptic consciousness does not possess a sense of inevitability. Unlike the overconfidence of the cornucopians for world development, 
I think of Fukuyama's end of history, for instance, or the arrogant anticipation of victory and self-sufficiency by the Christian right, apocalyptic spirituality does not fully know what is to come. The Messiah's coming can only be an absolute interruption, totally different from our present preconceived expectations. On the grounds in Yolanda and Thailand, doubts and fears born out of tragic and painful experience is a constant companion. Several weeks after the typhoon, hundreds would still run to the hills when someone malicious, maliciously shouts, the tsunami is coming. Everyone, like the whole community, runs up the hills for fear. But beyond these fears is a deep, fragile hope that prevents hegemonic narratives which had held the world in grip with their monstrous prognosis uh, of a glorious end that hope that these narratives will not rule again. Um, I, I come to my last point. The parish I work with has a church, church building all washed away except its altar wall. The day after the storm, the people collected its headless statues, placed them in the altar, and started to pray amidst the debris. Placed them uh, during these early morning masses, which we have celebrated in these destroyed chapels. People were just there with their flashlights since there was still no electricity, and their umbrellas since it was always raining and their roofs have gone away. I could sense their fatigue, their doubts and fears and insecurity. But they did not leave. They were just there, praying. And when I saw them standing, their fragile hope became a stinging indictment of all the world's indifference and self-sufficiency, those in my own heart included. Which brings me to my last point. Apocalyptic discourse is blamed for apathy and inaction. If the world will surely end in catastrophe and dystopia, can our insignificant steps prevent it? What is the place of human responsibility? That brings me to Metz, uh, 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 what does he say, a quotation from Metz. Our ap apocalyptical consciousness is not threatened with paralyzing fear of catastrophe. It is, on the contrary, called upon to display a practical solidarity with the least of the brethren that is clear from the apocalyptic chapters at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. I'll tell you one example to illustrate this one. There was a Navy officer who is assigned in another island, and his house is in the Yolanda area. Before, a week before, his children called him and said, Can you come home, Papa, and bring some food? And he didn't come home right away. He's still assigned. He's a Navy officer. And when he heard about the catastrophe, he went home right away. When he arrived at the place, the house is not yet there and neither his family. His neighbors told him that their, his wife is in the cemetery burying his three children. He brought the food with him. He wanted to throw it away in, out, out of frustration and despair. But he thought twice and he said, a lot of other hungry children are around here who lost their parents. This is probably, this is precisely what I mean by Solidarity and compassion in the midst of the apocalypse. In one of those debriefing sessions, I asked a group of farmers, what is next after Yolanda? And this farmer stood up right away and he said, we want to go back to our farms. It was like days before Christmas, and on Christmas morning it was raining. And I saw a group of farmers beginning to plant rice in their fields. I told myself, like the first Christmas, there are actually no angels who come down from heaven singing hallelujah. But I think Jesus is born here again today. This brings me to my last quotation. The Christian idea of imitation and the apocalyptic idea of imminent expectation belong together. It is not possible to imitate Jesus radically that is at the level of the roots of life if the time is not shortened. 
Apocalypse. Jesus called follow me, and the call of Christians, come Lord Jesus, are inseparable. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Father Gloria. Oops. Um, our next panelist, uh, next presenter, uh, is Rinaldo Roludo. Uh, he's a Roman Catholic priest of the Diocese of Malay Belay in the Philippines. Uh, he currently teaches systematic theology and serves also as the dean uh, at St. John Vigny uh, Theological Seminary in Cagayan de Oro City, and also in the Philippines. Um, prior to being a professor and the dean, he has directed a radio station, uh, has directed the Social Action Center of Diocese in Malay Belay, uh, and he's also uh, previously taught at Pope John the Twenty Third College Seminary uh, in Malay Belay City. He holds a doctorate uh, in theology and philosophy, uh, and received his licensate in sacred theology at the Catholic University of uh, Louvain in Belgium. He has several articles out. Uh, the two that are mentioned here uh, for your uh, to be of notice uh, is the church-based ecological struggles in the bishops engaging pastoral letters on ecology in the Philippines and his book Poverty and Ecology at the Crossroads. He's going to be presenting on eschatology, an eschatological perspective on our hope for a sustainable world. Please welcome Ronaldo. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. I'm very grateful to the organizers for having invited me to participate in this annual celebration of World Catholicism Week. My talk will focus on eschatological perspective on our hope for a sustainable world. I came from the Philippines, a country that suffers the worst ecological effects of climate change, together with other third world countries. All the other uh, Filipino speakers have already shared their experiences and stories yesterday. This also serves as my context. The series of deadly typh typhoons that hit our country became the center of global news coverage. Let us review the data of tropical typhoons that hit our country since 1991. The last three tropical storms are very alarming and they may lead one to think of an ecological apocalypse. Uh, by the way, uh, my family uh, was also a victim of Sendong Typhoon, the, the one in 2011. We lost a lot of properties and uh, our house also was uh, a little bit destroyed. This concern for ecological disaster is getting more urgent today as they threaten our vision of a sustainable world. Aware of this, of this urgency, this paper raises the question why our country is highly vulnerable to nature-related calamities. Can our Christian faith offer something to be able to hope for the future and transcend the temptation to despair. Theologizing in this context, I believe, requires the mediation of ecological sciences, and that's what I'm doing here. We deepen our ecological insights with the hermeneutic mediation of our eschatological vision of the final destiny of creation, which is the kingdom of God. According to the World Risk Report 2012, the Philippines is the third most vulnerable to disaster risk in the world. 
This country is beset by mutually reinforcing natural and human-induced disasters, which demand a careful ecological analysis to overcome the common tendency to see them as God's will that must be passively accepted. The new cosmological theory gives us a picture of a dynamically expanding and evolving universe. The Earth, as part of a self-shaping cosmos, has the power to destroy and to generate itself. Moreover, the Earth has its wild and uncontrollable dimensions that could render violence, storms, droughts, and chaos, which largely explain our experience of various cosmic disorders and catastrophes. The, Philippines, the Philippine archipelago, being situated within the Pacific Ring of Fire, has been adversely affected by a yearly occurrence of large-scale natural disasters throughout its geological history. The Global Volcanism Program identifies 50 volcanoes in the Philippines, which expose the country to threats of earthquakes and tsunamis. Moreover, an average of 20 tropical cyclones hit the country every year, and about nine of them cross the land. Indeed, the Filipinos are not strangers to these natural disasters. The wild forces of nature could be triggered by human factors. Let us quickly highlight at least four interrelated human-induced ecological disasters that emerge out of our unsustainable practices. First, there is the unsustainable deforestation. In 2005, the Food and Agriculture Organization reported that the rate of global deforestation between 1990 and 2005 averaged 14.5 million hectares per year. To date, the total remaining forest area worldwide is 3.8 billion hectares, which is approximately 30% of the global land area. In the Philippines, as of 2002, the Forest Management Bureau reported that the country's forest cover was only 24 of its total land area. And it has been proposed that the ideal forest cover is at least 54%. So we're a deficit of 30%. As a focal ecosystem, the severely damaged forest would not be able to deliver the expected ecosystem services, such as regulating water regimes, maintaining soil equality, limiting erosion, modulating climate, and maintaining biodiversity. An extreme deprivation of the ecological services of the forest would eventually affect the whole community of life. Soil-related tragedies. This is another human-induced problem which leads to soil erosion and landslides. It has been reported that 75 tons of soil worldwide are eroded each year by wind and water due to degraded state of the world forest. In the Philippines, where roughly over 40% of the land area is degraded, the volume of soil loss through erosion is estimated to be one meter deep over 200 thousand hectares each year, and this leads to landslides and siltation of many rivers and dams in the country. The third human-induced ecological disaster is social vulnerability. In the Philippine context, we can identify at least three main causes of people's vulnerability. One is poverty. According to the recent survey, the estimated poverty incidence in the Philippines is 24.9%. This makes the Philippines the third poorest country in Southeast Asia. The poor suffer the worst effects of ecological disasters. 
Another cause is the hazardous location. The growing population of the country at the, and the trend of urbanization, many of our people, especially the poor, were forced to reside on areas naturally prone to flooding and landslide zones. Furthermore, many of our people are ecologically vulnerable due to lack of disaster preparedness. With climate change, we expect that there will be more rain and it will happen more often and with more intensity. Unfortunately, many of our people, especially the poor, are not well informed on how to prepare for the potential volume of rain brought about by strong typhoons. Climate change phenomenon. The Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change affirms that climate change is anthropogenic or caused by greenhouse gases produced by human activities, especially deforestation. And this accounts for 18 to 20 percent of climate change. Accordingly, if we cannot prevent the Earth's climate from rising more than 2 degrees Celsius, one tragic event is biodiversity loss. The Philippines has been identified as uh, one of the 39 biodiversity hotspots worldwide owing to the loss of at least 70% of its endemic species. Another alarming ecological effect is the occurrence of abnormal weather. According to the IPCC report, it is likely, that means a probability of 66%, that tropical storms are to become both stronger and more frequent as the climate continues to warm. Now, I go to, I go to the part two, which is uh, uh, listening to the ecological scientists. The foregoing analysis leads us to raise question of the planet's survival. In response, many ecological scientists emphasize the resilience of the Earth in the face of ecological crisis. At this juncture, let us highlight the superorganism ecology, which represents two complementary theories of self-regulating capacity of our planet. One, on the one hand, the study of Frederick Clements. Uh, he shows that plant formation is the capacity to heal and regulate itself through the process of plant succession, which must progress from the stage, from one stage to another, and finally must terminate in the highest stage possible under climatic conditions. So that means the Earth can recover. On the other hand, James Lovelock holds that Earth behaves as a superorganism, making it the largest living thing in the solar system capable of maintaining the state of constancy in the face of the changing external conditions. And in his Gaia theory, Lovelock sees the Earth as having itself regulative capacity to adjust and to maintain conditions necessary for life in the face of external climatic changes. And he illustrated this with the use of his uh, Gaian model of white and uh, black daisy world. So his conclusion is that uh, our exploitative activities may weaken the earth but are unlikely to destroy her. Now let me make some position here. From our end, we affirm that the natural ecosystem have a regulating capacity which allows the Earth to recover from external and human assaults. However, it should be emphasized that the self-regulative capacity of the Earth is finite. Our unsustainable exploitation of the planet could paralyze the regular functioning of its ecosystems. Given the extent of the present ecological damages, it is clear that the Earth badly needs our assistance and cooperation to sustain its healthy condition. Let me now proceed to number three. The Christian hope for a sustainable world. The emerging cosmological theory that our planet will end in the future when the cosmic expansion will end either with big crunch or die out in a general concealment and darkness in any case, these speculations of the possible scenario significantly affirm the theological view on the 
common origin and common destiny of all created realities, including human beings. These new cosmological insights challenge our theological reflection in the light of the biblical vision of the kingdom of God. And in this endeavor, we find the Brazilian uh, theologian Leonardo Bov as a helpful dialogue partner. The sustainable world and our vision of kingdom of God. Leonardo Bov uh, fully recognizes the importance of the notion of sustainability. He is skeptical, however, with the vote to integrate this ecological term into, dominant, into the dominant model of economic development, as in the case of sustainable development. He considers the prevailing neoliberal capitalism as largely responsible for the present ecological crisis. As an alternative, Bob embraces the vision of the Earth Charter, which proposes the praxis of sustainable lifestyle. He explains that a lifestyle is sustainable when it allows Earth with its beauty and integrity and its abundant but limited resources to meet the current needs of all humankind in a way that will allow Earth to reproduce itself, to regenerate itself, and to continue its evolution at its, as it has done for four and a half billion years. And the quotation. This entails that we should not simply conserve or allow nature to recover so that we can resume plundering it again. According to Bob, we need to liberate the earth from the type of a development paradigm that incurably plunders the natural resources. Now, the Christian hope for a sustainable future is not based on scientific uh, theories of the future of the cosmos, but on the sources of Christian faith in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting, as our creed says. Both sadly noted that many modern thinkers have a low regard for religious experiences, which had their origins from our fantasy, from the realm of our imagination, and from the depth of our desire. In response, Boff emphasizes the potential role of these human capacities in overcoming the oppressive forces of the present reality. Through their mediation, Boff argues, we are pushed not to passively accept things as they are, but contest them, suspecting what is indeed true, that the real is much more than the apparently given. These human capacities enable us to generate utopia in its positive sense that does not conflict that's a conflict with reality, but rather discloses its potential and ideal dimension. The utopian dimension of the reality gives us courage to resist the temptation to resign in the face of the contradictory state of the present situation. For both, the biblical notion of kingdom of God may be described in utopian language as it perfectly summarizes everything that a human being can hope for. To pray for the coming of God's kingdom is to activate what Boff calls the most radical hopes of the human heart, which longs for the revelation of an absolute meaning that is to be realized by God in all creation. To highlight the ecological perspective of God's kingdom, Boff retrieved its uh, ancient Aramaic word, Malkuta da Laha, which is an empowering vision rooted in the presence of the divine in the cosmos. In other words, the kingdom of God is divine presence of the governing principles that guide the evolutionary process of the cosmos itself. For both, our ecological vision of a sustainable world may be seen as part of the larger vision of the coming of God's kingdom. Arguably, this eschatological perspective on the promise of a sustainable world is our particular theological contribution to the ongoing discussion on the future of the world. Our partial experience of sustainability of the world should lead us to hope for its full realization in the eschatological future. The Christian doctrine of continuous creation affirms that the creative presence of God unfailingly sustains the evolving creation to its final destiny. Final part. An ecological view on eschatology. Let us highlight two important features of Bob's uh, ecological view on eschatology. On the one hand, Bob crucially departs from the dominant theological assumption that God created a finished and perfect world. 
Both argues that this view could not be supported by the emerging evolutionary perspective of the modern sciences. To interpret the, the biblical story of creation with new eyes, Both embraces the view that the earthly paradise is what God intends, and it serves as an image of contrast with the present reality, an image of the time when all evil will be vanquished. In this light, Paradise is a prophecy of the future, projected back upon the past. This interpretation highlights the aspect of continuous creation, which affirms the unfinished process of evolution until it arrives at its desired perfection in the new creation of all things. Bob's appropriation of the new cosmological insights enables him to hope that, as always happens in the evolutionary process, chaos will give birth to a new and higher order, one that holds promise to all. This cosmic dynamism resonates with the biblical hope for the renewal of all things, which is not a creation out of nothing, but, in the words of Jürgen Moltmann, a heightening and a giving of new form to what is already there. This hope for a new cosmic order gives us light to our dream of a sustainable world and generates utopia that sustains our struggle for another possible world. On the other hand, Boff also discards the predominant anthropocentric perspective on eschatology, which unduly excludes non-human creatures from God's plan of salvation. Against this view, Boff repeatedly affirms that the whole cosmos, and not only humanity, is destined to God to enjoy eternal beatitude. He argues that fate of humanity cannot be separated from the earth as they make up a single entity. For both, the essential oneness of human being with the earth is confirmed by the biblical truth that the Lord God formed the human being from the dust of the ground. That's from Genesis chapter 2. Being formed out of the earth dust, or humus in Latin, Humans do not only essentially share common physical and chemical elements with all other earthly creatures, but also inseparably connected to the fate of the cosmos of which they are part. As their permanent home, the earth participates in the glorious transformation of humanity in the end time. Now for the conclusion. We have focused on the Philippine experience of natural calamities induced by unsustainable human activities. In our anal uh, ecological analysis, we emphasize the negative ecological effects of unsustainable deforestation on other ecosystems. However, reforestation is not enough. We also need to strengthen our adaptation measures as part of disaster management and preparedness. Our exploration on the different ecological insights on sustainability pushed us to hope for a sustainable world in the face of the present ecological crisis. We consider them as helpful ecological insights to update our theological reflection on the eschatological destiny of creation. And we in large both, we deepen our ecological perspective on eschatology, which aptly expresses the coming of God's kingdom in utopic language and gives us hope to the desirable perfection in the new creation of all things. This hope gives meaning to our ecological struggle for another possible world, which is our human response to God's gift of salvation. Thank you. Castillo, uh, who's going to be presenting on lament, prophecy, and the ecological crisis. Uh, Daniel Castillo serves as assistant prof uh, professor of theology at Loyola University in Maryland. Uh, he was recently named uh, as a fellow of peace and justice. Uh, he focuses on the connections between liberation theology and ecology. Uh, in his recent dissertation publication, uh, or soon to be published, hopefully, yeah, <laughs> uh, is an ecological theology of liberation, which brings together the work of Gustavo Gutierrez uh, in biblical studies and political ecology. 
He also was a Globe Fellow while at uh, his time at uh, Notre Dame, uh, and this has allowed him uh, extensive time to focus on environmental sciences while pursuing theological studies. So please welcome the third Daniel uh, to the podium, uh, Daniel Castillo. Good afternoon. Um, just one disclaimer uh, for my talk. Um, I wrote it primarily with church communities, with the Church of the Global North in mind, and so perhaps one way, uh, one thing we can talk about uh, during our discussion is how the terms of, of my talk might be transmutable to the churches of the Global South. I would like to begin, uh, the, well, the title of my uh, lecture today is Lament, Prophecy, and the Ecological Crisis, and I would like to begin with a brief passage from the prophet Jeremiah. <clears throat> it reads, I have seen the earth, and here in this place it is wildness and waste, and I look to the heavens and their light is gone. I have seen the mountains, and here they are wavering, and all the hills palpitate. I have seen, and here there is no human being, and all the birds of the heaven have fled. I have seen, and here the guarded land is now the wasteland, and all its cities are pulled down. Discussion regarding the ecological crisis today tends to emphasize the unprecedented scope of the social and ecological upheaval that the world now faces. To be sure, there is good reason to highlight the singularity of the situation in human history. However, as the passage from Jeremiah indicates, this is not the first time within the life of the church that the people of God have been threatened with catastrophe. For example, many of the Christian communities in Augustine's time would have experienced the sacking of Rome as an event of radical decimation. Indeed, one can note that the apostles likely perceived the crucifixion of Jesus in a similar manner. In cases such as these, it would have appeared in a very real sense that the world was being threatened with dissolution. Their world was being unmade. Therefore, as the contemporary church considers how it is called to respond to the complex and harrowing realities of the ecological crisis, it would do well to examine the Christian tradition, scrutinizing the manner in which the people of God have understood their relationship to God in the midst of previous experiences of decimation. This examination should be carried out for the purpose of discerning how these earlier responses might shape the imagination and praxis of the church today, informing the church as, how it, as to how it might best realize its vocation to be a sacrament of salvation for the world at a time when the world must confront the potentially catastrophic effects of the ecological crisis. Here, I will undertake such an examination, a brief one, by drawing our attention to several parallels between our situation today with respect to the ecological crisis and the experience of Judah leading up to the exile in 587 BC, perhaps, which was perhaps the most catastrophic event in the Old Testament and was the context for Jeremiah's ministry. My purpose is to elucidate how the prophetic imagination that was active in Judah in the time leading up to and during the exile can inform the thought and action of the contemporary church. As I noted just a, a moment ago, we live in a world that's facing unprecedented societal and ecological destabilization. Now, the reasons for this, the, these destabilizations are, are very complex. Um, here, I'm just going to kind of give you a thumbnail impression. Uh, you can probably accurate, accurately sum it up, at least in general terms, by quoting Wendell Berry, who says that our chief problem today is the big economy, 
The Earth's big economy has outgrown the great economy, which he means the globalized capitalist economy has outgrown uh, and outpaced uh, the biosphere's ability to, to cope with all the inputs and outputs. So, in fact, what, what you're looking at on the screen uh, are two, two images, actually. Uh, here you have uh, graphs depicting the greatest acceleration where what we've seen over the last 50 years, last 200 years, but especially the last 50 years, is just drastic rises in all types of measures of inputs, economic inputs and outputs. Um, and as a result, and this graph on the right will look familiar, we are now surpassing planetary boundaries that are required, uh, that we need to be in, in order for uh, human society to be able to kind of continue to function safely. Um, moreover, this is propelled and kind of continually exacerbated by the logic of uh, the global economy, which is every, all, all the structures are predicated upon the logic of endless capital accumulation. So the acceleration keeps getting pushed forward and pushed forward, the boundaries keep getting pushed further and further out, or at least they get, it's harder and harder to deal with the impacts. Now, I would like to turn here to the work, with, with that background in mind, I would like to turn here to the work of uh, sociologist Leslie Sclair, global sociologist Leslie Sclair, who locates kind of the roots of the structures, the roots of the logic. Well, given that the logic is what it is, Leslie Sclair finds that the structures of the global system are relying upon the spread of what he terms the culture ideology of consumerism. And it's this culture ideology that I would like to explore here in more detail. So whereas the, the two of the speakers in the panel before us looked at the problematic ways in which uh, our economy values nature, here I'm looking at the, the problematic ways in which uh, the economy forms human persons as subjects. So in describing the culture ideology of consumerism, Sclair asserts that the dramatic growth in advertising and communications technologies over the last century have allowed transnational corporations to create and promulgate the fictive persona of the consumer as ideal person. In describing this persona, Sclair writes, quote, the culture ideology of consumerism proclaims literally that the meaning of life is found in the things that we possess. To consume, therefore, is to be fully alive. And to remain fully alive, we must consume. And so I, the, the image on the left actually captured this quite well theologically, because St. Irenaeus right, talks about the glory of God being the human person fully alive. And for Irenaeus, right, this is Christ and the love of Christ, that, the love that Christ expresses. For what, what Sclair finds, is its homo consumens, that to be fully alive, we must consume, we must consume. So this is, in fact, eclipsed a Christian anthropology of what it means to be fully alive. Moreover, Sclair argues that today the culture ideology of consumerism has become virtually hegemonic, colonizing the life world of any society tied to the global economy. The fictive persona of the consuming person thus appears to be on the verge of becoming an unrivaled global ideal. Importantly, Scler observes that the ideal of person as consumer is essential to the life of global capitalism. This is because the functioning of the system is predicated upon the continuous accumulation of capital, and it is the act of consumption that drives the process of accumulation. Thus, he comments, quote, without consumerism, the rationale for continuous capital, capital accumulation dissolves." End quote. The culture ideology of consumerism, then, is the glue that holds the system together. For my analysis here, it is also vital to note that Sclair detects an implicit, an implicit faith in progress built into the culture ideology of the global system. According to this worldview, the act of consumption not only promises the good life, 
It also promises an increasingly better life. Here, faith and progress is tied most strongly to the innovative items and technologies that we, that we are created and consumed. However, this faith also extends to human ingenuity in general. Thus, one finds that those who have been socialized within the culture ideology of consumerism maintain a belief when faced with the apparent threats posed by the ecological crisis, that human ingenuity will be able to remedy these threats. In order to understand the dangers inherent in an uncritical faith in progress, which will allow us to see more clearly why the business as usual approach uh, remains regnant today, it is helpful to, once again for this panel, turn to the thought of theologian Johann Baptist Metz. At the dawn of postmodernity, Metz argued that a false metaphysics of progress still colored the collective imagination of the West. As he saw so perceptively, perceptively, this ideology of progress engenders a mode of existence for which the human person, uh, for the human person, which relieves her from the responsibility of acting. Among the reasons that this is so is that under the influence of this ideology, political and ethical life have been eclipsed by technical reason and a faith that efficiency and market logic will produce the best possible worlds. The human person need only go along with the formulae of the planners. Thus, Metz finds that the cult of progress which affirms humanity's omnipotence in its ability to manage its own destiny gives way to a, quote, cult of apathy and to the apolitical life, end quote. According to Metz, accordingly, Metz sums up the spirit of contemporary society by quoting Bertolt Brecht, writing, when atrocities happen, it's like the rain falls. No one shall stop it anymore. This, it seems to me, continues to capture the zeitgeist of our situation today. Under the influence of the culture ideology of consumerism, we have been able to ignore the ethical and political imperatives that the ecological crisis present to us as a global society. As a result, business as usual continues. No one shall stop it anymore. Now, this situation in my view, bears a striking formal resemblance to the socio-political atmosphere of Judah on the eve of the exile. As Brueggemann describes it, as Walter Brueggemann describes it, in the years leading up to the exile, Judah had, tr become, had truly become a nation like other nations. Under the monarchy, Judah's programs of governance came to approximate the type of imperial regime from which God had delivered the Hebrews through the exodus. As such, the monarchy of Judah maintained and expanded its wealth through power, uh, wealth and power through the exploitation of the poor and the abuse of the land. So if you look at the two images uh, on the screen right now, we have one actually referring back to Mike Northcott's uh, talk yesterday evening. You have Elijah confronting uh, Ahab and Jezebel about their appropriation of land. And then you have on the right, uh, Nathan... Uh, accusing David of acting rather shrewdly with uh, Uriah and Bathsheba. So this is the situation of the monarchy leading up to the exile. Now at the same time, the monarchy, according to Brueggemann, gave rise to an ideology that sanctioned Judah's exploitative power arrangements. This ideology, which Brueggemann dubs the royal consciousness, maintained that the socio-political order established by Judah was in fact a divine order. Thus, the royal consciousness permitted no talk of alternatives. One's only option was to bow down to the shrewd knowledge of the monarchy. Importantly, Brueggemann observes that in sanctioning the status quo, quote, the royal consciousness led people to numbness especially numbness to numbness about death, end quote. This is because in order to ex affirm the exploitative regime of the monarchy, one must become desensitized to the deaths and sufferings 
upon which the kingdom was built. It is this culture of numbness and denial endemic to the royal consciousness that allows the monarchy to maintain its claims of legitimacy. Since there is a denial of unjust suffering and of sin, there is no impetus for change. Nothing new need come about in history. Since no one shall stop it anymore, business as usual can persist. The exile, of course, shatters the monarchy's presumption. And tellingly, Brueggemann observes that when the exile does occur, when Judah is cast off its land because of its sins, when its social order is decimated, when it appears that, as Brueggemann puts it, history is over, the royal consciousness has nothing to offer. Since this ideology was so deeply interwoven with the maintenance of the dominant order, when the dominant order collapses, the royal consciousness cannot imagine something new emerging. It cannot find reason to hope. It can only give itself over from denial to despair. It is in these times of pending and realized catastrophe that Brueggemann observes Judah coming to rely upon the vision and imaginations of its prophets. Within the alternating situations of seemingly timeless hegemony, be it monarchy or global capitalism, and ruin, the exile, the ecological crisis, it is the prophet who has the ability to see the most fearful aspects of reality, and with this view of reality, and with this reality in view, imagine a new future. Thus, the prophetic imagination has at its disposal the power to counter the royal consciousness. Indeed, both in times of the status quo and in times of radical destabilization, it is the prophet who calls the people of God, and indeed the whole world, to conversion. In view of our current situation with respect to ecological degradation and the culture ideology of consumerism, I would suggest that an especially important task for the church today is the cultivation of its prophetic imagination. In appealing to the need for the prophetic within our present day context, however, my claim here is somewhat more specific. In particular, I believe that it is the prophetic task of lament that must be fostered with the greatest urgency within the church today. As Brueggemann observes, an essential task of the prophet was to express the pathos that had been collectively denied by a culture under the influence of the royal consciousness. And in doing so, make present symbols of lament within the public and political spheres, symbols that are able to adequately capture the terror of current and future realities, Symbols that, when presented rightly, lead us to mourn. The question, of course, is this, why grief? What is the purpose of embracing or even cultivating lament? To these questions, Brueggemann suggests that the numbness, denial, and despair fostered by the royal consciousness can only be broken by, quote, the embrace of negativity and by the public articulation that, are we, that we are both fearful and ashamed of the future we have chosen." End quote. Lament, the task of mourning, as it were, is the work that permits the human person or community to see reality in all its darkness and not be overcome by the darkness. Lament, then, is the praxis which allows one to break through the cycle of despair and denial, both which leave the person incapacitated. Permitting the possibilities of conversion, consolation, and hope to emerge. Brueggemann's argument finds support in the contemporary work of systems theorist and psychoanalyst Joanna Macy. Macy, who is a professor at the Graduate Theological Union at Berkeley, has worked at length with individuals and communities in uncovering and working through their latent environmental guilt and despair. Macy has observed that this despair, when not confronted, tends to hold the person or community captive, 
vitiating one's ability to respond to the crisis in meaningful ways. When the information that we have regarding the ecological crisis is not met with corresponding grief, Macy argues, persons tend to be driven deeper into denial or become even more overwhelmed by a sense of futility. Simply put, information alone is not enough. However, in her practice, Macy has found that through honest and painful lament, the person or community can find not only the power to confront the realities of the ecological crisis and social devastation, the person or community can also uncover the generative power that allows one to imagine a new future and in so doing, enter into deeper forms of solidarity with the world. It appears then, amidst the specter of anthropogenic sin and its effects, and within the seemingly universal culture ideology of consumerism, that the church, if it is to recognize its vocation to be sacrament of salvation, must become a site of mourning, a conduit for lamentation. The church no doubt has within its resources symbols that are powerful enough to unveil the terrors of the world uh, with which the world is now threatened. A pressing task then is to cultivate a prophetic consciousness around these symbols with respect to the ecological crisis so that as the people of God mourn, so as to help the people of God mourn, so that in turn they might bear the weight of reality and the weight of salvation, daring to hope and imagine and enact a new way forward. Thank you. In, in that context, in that context, it's more real and more personal. Lament of 
your family members who died, lament of houses that are not there anymore. I mean, you have spent your lifetime building those houses and they are not there. It's, it's just a lament that you could not even find your loved one. It, it's, it's, it's not about a concrete uh, social analysis of capitalism destroying the environment. It's, it's more personal than that. I mean, it's, it's a lament of the loss, this which is just in front of you. And, and I think that that strikes very hard in them. That is why, in, in that context, there is time for them to cry. In fact, they have been crying. But on the other hand, I was also trying to reflect on when, when you were talking. In that context, there is there was also a need to laugh. Uh, it's, it's you cannot ju just cry forever. You, you have you have you have to have a sense of hope by laughing. And and the signs that I have seen and I have presented there is. Is that sign, no? the, the other side of lament, which is also lament. Uh, I, I celebrate in Masas, uh, in the Philippines, we have nine days before Christmas, we have what we call Simpang Gabi, or it's the dawn masses, nine days before Christmas, which they celebrate at dawn. So when I arrived in that parish, the parish priest told me, uh, I told him, Father, I can help you with these masses, and he said, okay, thank you very much that you have come. So we will celebrate masses. You will celebrate masses with me. We will divide all these places, and said, "Okay, and how many masses would you celebrate?" I, I, up to you, Father. I said, "Okay, you can celebrate eight, and I will celebrate eight every day." I have never celebrated that number of masses every day in my life, <laughs> but but in these masses, I um, I am in a quandary of uh, wondering what to say. Uh, can I go on with their crying? Can I make them, uh, help them cry? Or can I lift up their spirits? And in the end, I decided maybe it's about time to give them some source of lifting up. And in the end of those homilies, I think they, they really thought and said, thank you for saying that homily. They were just laughing the whole time. It was the laugh therapy that uh, what Stan was talking about yesterday. They, they were laughing and they said, I, I think now there is another, the other side of life. Which for me, in that context, was very difficult because I was so affected. In, you, you have people here dying. And, but I also was thinking that hope and laughter was part of the love. I don't know, I'm trying to figure it out. Did it help them lament? And I told myself, maybe yes. Uh, my case. Uh, it's very hard to explain what lament is if uh, you have not experienced it personally in flesh and blood. Um, I would like to begin with my personal experience. Uh, my mother just died uh, last year, uh, October. And uh, uh, prior to that, uh, uh, she had been suffering uh, due to complicated uh, illness. And uh, I journeyed with her uh, in the deathbed until the deathbed. And, uh, you know, I've been attending several, as a priest, uh, attending several funeral, funeral masses, uh, doing uh, sacrament, administering sacrament uh, of the anointing of the sick. But uh, somehow it's different when the really more intimate person time. So there I realized how to grieve, how to really ask questions to God, uh, why my mother has to suffer, had to suffer that way. So 
For me, lament is not. It's a biblical term. Uh, it's a positive term because we need it to in our prayers. We have to cry. Uh, in our sadness, we have to and uh, suffering, we have to grieve. And uh, it remains a word until you experience it yourself. So, uh, for me, that word lamentation or cry, uh, grieving is uh, very, very, very personal. Now, from the third world context, uh, we are not strangers to this. Uh, as I have presented and my other colleagues from the Philippines who also share their stories of uh, these tragedies, you know, ecological tragedies, uh, especially typhoon, floods. Uh, we've, been, we've been journeying to these people who are suffering. So again, this word cry, grieving, suffering with compassion are not floating. So I, I may lack words to explain it, but uh, I know what it is in experience. So we need to experience it, I think. Yeah, which, which brings me to a question for, for Daniel. Uh, I, I think that's a good proposal in the context of environmental discourse, the need, to, the need for our churches to be places of lament. In, in concrete, in the, in the global north, what does that actually mean? I mean, uh, how, how do you express that, uh, that, that desire to be spaces of lament? You know, what, what concrete things do you do you know, in the context of ecological discourse? Start with a, can you hear me? I'll start with a complete cop-out answer and then I'll try and move, move my way into not cop-out zone. Um, one is, I don't know, I think that's what we need to, that's the, probably the first step is communities in the north need to start really reflecting on what that even means and how we do that. Now with that said, I think, you know, it's wholly appropriate for churches to enter into communities, right, within churches, if not whole parishes, um, entering into periods of fasting um, with each other, signifying this, like, varieties of fasting, right, um, and trying to become a little bit stiller to then listen to, to kind of the realities of the typhoon, right? I think when, when the typhoon, so let me back up and say, one thing that's been that struck me here is the through through a number of different panels was just the magnitude of this event in the Philippines and how devastating it's been. And for me, it was a blip on my radar. I think I was finishing my dissertation and moving and the same like week that this hit, right? Like it didn't register at all other than, oh wow, that, that was a really bad event. Um, and then I forgot about it. So as a paper, I think maybe in the last panel, noted, right? The reality, like, we kind of kid ourselves when we talk about, well, the reality, when we project the negative effects of climate change, of ecological degradation, of social inequality into kind of future cataclysms or down the road 50 years, 100 years, two centuries from now. The reality is that's been taking place for a long time, so those inequities. And so, somehow taking, figuring out a way to be able to listen to the suffering of others, right? I mean, this is what Rugerman says, the royal consciousness does not permit you to see, it covers over the realities of what's going on. So figuring out a way to do that as, as church, as community, is one part of it. But I, I think fasting you know, is, is probably a key, actually. There can be all, all sorts of, of different fasting. And also cultivating the, the symbols of the church precisely like to deal with, or, or to speak to the ecological crisis and the, so, the socio-ecological crisis, right? So, Ea Korea, the, the Jesuit martyr, when he talks about the cross, when he talked about the cross, he talked about the crucified people on the cross. And this is the reality that we need to confront. Like, we need to cultivate symbols appropriate to the crucified people and the tree of life. Are there any other questions? Uh, 
maybe, maybe this one is for Ray. Um, uh, both uh, are versus an evolutionary scatology that things would develop and they they would reach their perfect entity. Uh, in, in the context of match, which, which I was using, Daniel was using, uh, that precisely is the problem. The evolutionary thinking, uh, self-sufficiency, that in one way or the other, uh, things would develop positive, positively as they are, which is quite different from apocalyptic uh, eschatology. Uh, I don't know how, of course, there are a lot of other eschatologies, like uh, you have a whole range of them. I don't know how both would 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 answer what it, what could be Mets. Of course, they're not talking to each other, but uh, could, what could be Mets? Uh, what is this objection to to evolutionary thinking in, in ecology? You know? uh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, it is clear uh, for both that uh, evolution, evolutionary thinking is different from teleological, as if uh, the, the future is uh, smooth and uh, very certain. Uh, the, uh, one way of understanding evolution is its, it's complexity, uh, you cannot even predict it. Uh, it's, uh, it's open, uh, but the both likes it because uh, that is uh, the, the, the dynamism of the cosmos. The cosmos is cosmogenesis, life, biology is biogenesis, and even human beings, anthropogenesis. And if you, uh, but these things uh, are should be. Uh, we dis distinguish from uh, teleological thinking uh, because along the way it's open for error, it's open for uh, for the future, uh, not the smooth one. Uh, so there is that uh, uh, element in uh, the, the, the theology of both, the appropriation of both when it says uh, evolutionary. Maybe it's uh, a post-Darwinian. Uh, uh, evolutionary uh, idea uh, because today even uh, the environment not only life uh, even the abiotic community are also influencing the biotic community so there is that mutuality this cooperation not competition so the, the, the evolutionary theory is complex uh, uh, in the post-Darwinian Darwinian sense so I guess uh, Bob is coming from that sense when he appropriates that, uh, uh, say, uh, evolutionary thinking to understand eschatology. So imagine, uh, as I have already stated there, uh, he says that uh, he's open that along the way there may, there may be uh, damages, uh, it's not smooth, but it allows you to continue because uh, evolution continues in not in a linear but in a complex way open but not uh, really teleo teleological but uh, there are I would, would say that uh, there are other writings above that uh, says uh, that evolution is purposeful uh, there's a purpose there's there's a meaning uh, even in the in the midst of this uh, complexity uh, sometimes uh, damages along the way. And uh, my question goes to you, Danny. It's just a very simplistic question. What did you tell the audience at Christmas? Where did you tell them that their brothers and sisters who perished? What happened to them? 
I have eight masses every day, so I have to remember which one I have uh, I told which one. Uh, well, um, okay. Um, there, there were several things that, well, uh, there was a picture there that, um, that there were, we, we had what we call the briefing sessions. Uh, beyond, beyond the homilies, we have the, brief, the briefing session. So we go to the communities, we gather the people, and we have some sort of activity in order for them to express what they actually felt, the loss, etc. And, and the, the first question that, that we ask in these debriefing sessions is, is um, what, what, does this, what does this mean for you? Of course, then, then you can bring out all the kinds of responses. Uh, that there are also people who were like questioning God, what happened here, why did it come this way, etc. But the general thing that came out was, in fact, uh, there must be a meaning to this. They did not know, but there must be a meaning. So they, it was like that open. Actually, if the question is, what did I tell? I did not tell much. It, it was they who told it to themselves. And there were mainly two questions. And the next one is the question of what's next after Yolanda. Then, then they, from, from whatever the experience, they began to project something. And one, one striking answer was, we want to go back to our farms. That's one which, which I quoted. So it, it's, it's that, no, I, I think in, in answer also to Daniel, I, I think it's that process of lamentation which is not only past-oriented but also future-oriented. I mean, this does not stop here, it has to continue. Uh, I think if there is anything that I said, it's, it's the questions that we pose. Um, well, there are other things in the homily, you can say many things, but even in the homilies, I don't start uh, uh, whatever I want to tell them. I start with questions. And I still can remember that, that one of those masses, the question was on Elizabeth, and, and uh, the, the gospel was on Elizabeth uh, bearing a child. And, and the question that I posed them, I said, well, who is oldest among you here? Yes, there was someone who was like 70, 75 years old, a woman. She stood that I'm the oldest, okay, come, come here. What if you go home today and in your house you will see an angel and tells you you're going to get pregnant today? And, and, and her response was funny. We have no more house, Father. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 what I mean, Eve. And that she was so funny. I said, I, I'll tell the angel, are you sure? <laughs> so, and, and all this, and all this stuff, that, which, which actually, well, made them think that there are other possibilities beyond the impossible. So, and precisely, well, that was the gospel, what the gospel is all about. So if, if I answer the question, what did I tell them? No, I, I think the answer is, I think what, what did they tell themselves? And they know the answers. You don't have to tell it to them. about um, you think that deforestation is interrupting the nitrogen cycle. Is that correct? You think that deforestation is interrupting the nitrogen cycle. Is that right? Okay, I just want to make sure. How do you tie in the concept of homeostasis with what your theme of your whole lecture was, which was um, eschatological themes or something like that? How do you tie that in with that? How the earth corrects. Do you need me to repeat the question? Uh, can you repeat? Okay. You claim, you said in your lecture that deforestation is interrupting the nitrogen cycle. Is that correct? Okay. Okay, I wanted to make sure about that. Okay. 
So, um, which means that the rain is able to cycle through the clouds, come back to the earth, through the respiration of trees, all right? So, um, the concept of homeostasis, how did you tie that in to your eschatological, esch I can't even say it, eschatological theme? How does that tie in together with what you were talking about, the ecology and all that? How do you tie that in together? You want me to connect? Uh, yeah, the concept of homeostasis together. Homeostasis, okay. Yes, together with the eschatological theme that the Catholic Church talks about the end of time. Yeah, uh, that's the second part of my presentation uh, when I talk about homeostasis. Yeah. Yes, you I, did. You didn't say that word, but yes, that's what you were talking uh, about. Yeah. Right. I it's wanted to know how. Text. Could you ex clarify that and explain that a little bit more? Because I didn't really understand what the what the connection was between those two. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, I must confess I'm not a, a scientist and an ecologist, but uh, I will answer your question. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, reforestation and homeostasis. When you say homeostasis, it's a, uh, a state of stability attained by an uh, ecosystem uh, because that, uh, it has already reached that uh, stage uh, given the conditions. And uh, I emphasize the role of the forest, uh, especially its uh, ecosystem services. And uh, if I consider that, and uh, many writers consider that a focal ecosystem to the effect that uh, if you destroy that, many ecosystem services will, be, uh, will not be delivered. Uh, I've enumerated at least five. So if uh, a forest uh, as an ecosystem is destroyed, uh, many things, it, it has a domino effect. There will be chains of reactions and it will affect the rest of the ecosystem. So I consider the strengthening of the forest or the reforestation as a very important uh, uh, activity, especially with our global problem of deforestation, uh, in the Philippines especially. Uh, if we continue the trend of deforestation, uh, as I have already noted, uh, it will uh, end in uh, ecocide. Uh, many uh, dependent, many species, living species dependent on the forest as their habitat will really perish or become extinct. And uh, you know, when one species is removed or is no longer there is extinct so their niche there there will be no no more uh, 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 for example certain species who would do this function in the ecosystem so that will affect the homeostasis the stability of an ecosystem so that's why i emphasize uh, the focal role of, of the, the ecosystem of the forest as a focal ecosystem because if you touch that it will affect the soil, it will affect the water, it will affect the climate and it will kill also, it will uh, uh, affect the biodiversity. So when all these things are not functioning, what you have is uh, a dead uh, for uh, a dead land or barren land or you say uh, it's no longer a living ecosystem. Uh, that's my point of view. So it's important to really uh, reforest and have a very healthy ecosystem of the forest. Dan, the way you put it after your talk was that um, 
sorry, Dan, uh, yeah, big Dan. Um, tall Dan. Um, you made it sound like lament was about sin and it was about repentance for sin by people that are you know, like us who are causing it. Um, is that what you mean? I mean, is there something more that you mean by re lament than repentance? Or does repentance uh, capture it? <clears throat> That's a good question. I don't know if I would identify lament with repentance, but I think what I'm trying to do, and that's a good question for saying this, for allowing me to articulate this, is that lament, is foreground lament, is an integral element of repentance. That, so information is not enough alone. And alone is not enough, right? That, that somehow we need to enter into a space of mourning, really, to, to meet with the, to face the information, and to have the possibility of, of transformation. I don't know if I would identify wholly with, reconcil uh, with repentance, but it's certainly a necessary element of the latter. Solidarity, in terms of because the, the suffering, as it were, that's, that's gone on uh, through the, um, the typhoon, to connect that in a sense as part of the lament of those in the global north. So there's not this disconnect between the mourning, as it were, that's taking place in the global south and the and the maybe emerging uh, regret or, or uh, disturbance that's come out of the of the action. So so perhaps you could. Can we think about how those two might, those two pieces of the puzzle will go together, and, and, and maybe even um, uh, for some of those in, in poverty in the, in, the global, in the global south, whether they have any sense of some of the reasons why some why the, the structures of the society that they're in weren't ready for this kind of event? Because if that had happened somewhere else, then they might not have been in that position. See what I'm saying? So I'm sure there was no sense of of blame for others in this, but is there a way of, of trying to, if you like, come to um, a sense of mutuality, you know, across global understanding that would help each party to have a deeper sense of, of mutual responsibilities? Um, uh, so that's one of my questions. And the other one really backs on one of the, the queries we had about um, ecos ecology and ecosystems, which comes to the, to uh, Dan number Three, three in the middle. Um, Rinaldo. Yeah, Rinaldo. Yeah, uh, because because I what I'm thinking of is um, here is I think the part of the question was about what seems like the stability of ecosystems in relation to eschatology or apocalyptic, which seems to move forward into the future. Um, but what we need to understand is there's been quite a radical shift in the philosophy of ecology in the last 20 years or so away from this idea of ecology as a stable system to one which, and I'm sure you know this yourself, I'm trying to put it down, one that's much more fragile and liable to disturbance, including the disturbance engendered by humans. And that means that there isn't this sort of homeostatic system which is a stable system, but it's, it, there's a movement all the time, and, and we're part of that movement. And so I don't know how to connect these pieces together, but perhaps there could be a recognition in the lament that we're part of that, that movement, that wider ecological movement, um, and the responsibility we have, not just to stabilize, but maybe to, to put this into a new, maybe a different study state, is also enabling flourishing in some way for all parties. Uh, so there's, there was always going to be a movement, but what do we do afterwards, as it were, you know, if you like, the post, the post natural, the, the post of the apocalypse that's happened, then what are, the, what are the kind of actions we need to take, um, if any, you know. So in other words, we you have a very doom-filled end, but you know, is there anything, is there any remnant? There's a huge, often a, a resilience in ecosystems to recover, and it's how we sort of act in the, in the face of that, it's interesting to think through. So I think, I think what we have is maybe a couple questions that are emerging. One
is kind of on the issue of solidarity uh, and the connection between lament and solidarity. Uh, is there one? Can we talk? Can we speak to that? So maybe for the two Dan's to talk to, and then for Ronaldo, uh, uh, Ronaldo to, to talk to uh, this ongoing kind of uh, what seems like an incompatibility between uh, an ecosystem that exists kind of sustained and sustaining itself in perpetuity. Um, and then uh, an eschatological shape, which might be more future-oriented or, or more of a direction point. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you for your uh, question, Celia. The, I guess my, my brief answer to that, that question would be, it's, it's a really good question, and I'll just highlight one danger in thinking through that from the Global North, which is, I spoke about the culture ideology of consumerism. Vince Miller, in, in his book on consumerism, points out that we have a tendency now to consume everything, including spectacle. So including, in, in the global north, we have a, a tendency just to consume catastrophe, feel kind of this emotional catharsis, and then we move on with our day. And that can't be what lament is. It has to be something that, and that's why I use the term cultivate, it has to be something that's cultivated into our identities as church in a community together um, so that it becomes constitutive and isn't something that's uh, fleeting from one spectacle to the other but allows for then the possibility of lament moving to solidarity. Thank you. Um, my response to, to, to the question of said is this. Um, I'm reflecting on how people on the ground understand Eschatological or the, the ecological and environmental problem, especially the poor. Uh, actually, the predominant perspective is self introspective. The, the basic question that they ask is so, what did I do to destroy the environment? And, and in the Philippines, for instance, you have subsistence farming, they cut all these trees in order to plant some corn or some rice a little spot, less than a hectare, something like that, for personal and family subsistence. And then they begin to blame themselves and say, yeah, because we cut all these trees. But that's for survival. Uh, my question in solidarity and in the context of justice is, can, can we conscientize people more that the problem is not actually what they did to survive? In fact, big companies are logging and mining. And if I expand the question more in terms of solidarity, I think the global north has consumed more than the little trees that they cut in order to survive. That structural analysis in environmental consciousness is not present among a lot of people. In one way or the other, there is also a problem with people doing ecology on the ground and telling that what they're doing is destroying the environment, Well, in fact, big companies are destroying the environment. That critique is not present. And, and, and an example of that is how people in the global north spend paper. You have just paper everywhere. Paper in the toilets, paper, plastic, uh, uh, paper, uh, paper plates, etc. And we, the students in the schools in the third world, does not even have paper to write on. That gap is not present in the analysis and ecological, what is this, uh, programs. So if solidarity is going to happen, I think that structural analysis should be present in, in, in ecological analysis. This is a very interesting question because uh, I'm also questioning this. this is, these are all my questions uh, when I was studying uh, even the idea of balance of nature, uh, uh, considering uh, that our, we experience nature as uh, sometimes a balance. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, it's destroyed, distorted. Uh, but it is true that we, are, we, are, we can experience a certain stability 
though it will not last. Uh, but we should not uh, uh, say demerit it, or we still have to recognize it as real and concrete experience of uh, stability in nature, in uh, ecosystem. Somehow, uh, while we are in this historical uh, existence, uh, historical moment of our existence, we are always experiencing peace, peace by peace, uh, particular and partial. But that particular and partial is real. So uh, we experience stability, uh, moment of stability, uh, what you call homeostasis. But the uh, the fullness, the perfection of this experience will be in the eschatological future. Uh, maybe by analogy, we will I can use Bob's, uh, for example. Uh, understanding of the relationship between liberation and salvation. Now, in history, we are experiencing uh, several moments of liberation. And they are concrete, partial, yet we still hope that this will be completed, this will become full in the eschatological future, and that is salvation. So that's how we distinguish. In the same way, uh, I would like to use that framework to help me, uh, to help us understand the uh, eschatology and the experience of instability uh, of the ecosystem. Uh, well, the ecosystem is still uh, imperfect, but there is a quality of uh, balance, stability, though very, very delicate, but still it has to be recognized. So, again, in relation to Okay, so uh, another word for eschatology here is new creation or the renewal of creation. So that's uh, in connection to the continuous creation that in the future that will be uh, there will be fullness and uh, complete and perfect uh, uh, redemption or salvation of the whole creation. Well, let's say thank you to our panel. I'm sorry, we're, we're out of time. Maybe you can hold it and approach them after after we're done. Um, let's let's give a hand to our panelists.